So hello, you are watching an independent a collaboration between BBC Introducing and Independent Venue Week. So I'm Sarah Gosling. I present BBC Music Introducing in the Southwest, representing Devon, Cornwall and Somerset, where all of these fabulous people joining me are from who are going to introduce themselves in just a moment. Heads up for you guys. So we wanted to show some love to an independent venue in the Southwest, aka Exeter Phoenix in particular, and offer nuggets of advice to upcoming artists, courtesy of our phenomenal international tourists, Ferris and Sylvester, but we're going to go around the room. So I'm going to start with you, Ellen, in the top left. Do you want to introduce yourself, tell us a bit about you, and we'll go around. Um, hi, my name's Ellen. Um, I'm also known as Threlin. Um, Don't ask why, I don't even know why. But um, I recently put out my first song um, onto BBC Introducing, and Sarah, very lovely, has played it quite a few times. Um, and yeah. So it's it's quite new for me, all of this, but yeah. That's why we have James, your turn. Hey, yes, my name's James, AKA Sushi Sound. Um, I'm a musician uh, and professional champagne popper. Uh, <laughs> going... <laughs> yeah, I'm from South London. I'm a dental student in Plymouth, just enjoying myself, enjoying my life, making some tunes and making some waves, baby. Yay. That's all I like. Karen, you're up. Uh, I'm Karam, or also known as Web Moms. I produce music. I also book tours and promote gigs for the company Boneyard Promotions. Um, Working between Devon, Cornwall, and a little bit of Bristol, um, and I perform. Beautiful, Caitlin. Um, hi, I'm Caitlin, um, also known as Suki. Um, I just make music in my bedroom i don't know <laughs> amazingly and you kind of along with ellen threelin and ollie are our kind of new to live music artists brilliant producers amazing artists but kind of making when gigs are allowed back which is something we'll touch on those tentative steps into the live arena speaking of which ollie explain yourself uh hi i'm ollie hannaford i produce uh i'm a songwriter and a singer and um and yeah i'm kind of looking towards the live side of my life i guess <laughs> the live side of life um two people who know that very well izzy and archie ferris and sylvester tell us just a little bit about yourself and kind of your touring experience we are ferris and sylvester uh izzy and archie we are a folk blues rock and roll band um and before 2020 happened we were kind of doing 100 plus shows a year um, in support slots and festivals and our own tours. Um, yeah, can't wait to get back out there when time allows. Mm, itchy feet is what I think it's fair to say you guys have got. And then literally in the middle of the chat, at the core of the independent venue week discussion, Mr. Venues himself, Patrick Cunningham. Now, you told me something that I didn't know about you, which just boosted your prestige, which is already like sky high in my eyes the other week. Give us a little bit of background, Patrick, on, on how you became a director of Exeter Phoenix and how you got there. OK, so I, I run Exeter Phoenix um, venue in Exeter with three, about three different performance spaces. Uh, I also manage all the live bookings, uh, book all, all the bands and liaise with lots of external promoters as well. Um, I think what you're referring to is I also started the Cavern Club uh, back in the early 90s wow. uh, with, with Dave, who's, who's still there. Um, and I've always been a concert promoter. I've always put on gigs in Exeter and the Southwest. So that's very much my background. Mm -hmm. I love Karim's reaction to that, by the way, which is exactly what mine was <laughs> on air. I'm sorry. You're responsible yeah. for two of the most important venues in the Southwest, which is absolutely incredible. And I can guess what the answer to this question is going to be, Patrick. How has the last, let's say, year been for Exeter Phoenix as a, as a hybrid arts venue? Well, obviously difficult, challenging. I mean, it's been a, it's been a roller coaster ride. You know, stop, start, stop, start. Um, you know, we, we, we've had to be closed, we're closed now. I'm the only person here at the moment in, in the building. Um, I'm kind of looking after it, I'm a custodian. Uh, so yeah, very, very, very frustrating, very challenging. Uh, but it's gonna be a great, it's gonna be a great year. It's gonna be great, awesome. There's so much sort of booked in, so much waiting to happen. Uh, we're just waiting to, you know, for the, for the, the say so. Like mm. everybody, we're waiting to, to open up, you know, as soon as we can. 
to get to going. Well, I've seen some of my favourite gigs ever at Exeter Phoenix. It was actually the first proper time on a stage that wasn't the BBC Studios that I saw Ferris and Sylvester perform as well, which was when we did our introducing showcase down there. So before we get into, you know, live music struggling and maybe perhaps tips, I think let's start on a high with everyone's favourite gigs. So this can either be, because I'm nice, a gig that you've put on, a gig that you've performed, or a gig that you've seen. So one that really sticks out in my mind to start is at a venue in Plymouth called The Junction, which is actually where I bought this vintage 2017 independent venue week t-shirt, um, was the band called Childcare. And it really stood out because it was like a tiny gig. There were like maybe 50 people there, but they clearly had such control and confidence about the stage and their live performance so much so that midway through their brilliant already like groove inducing set they just went okay everyone we need you to be silent could you please just close your eyes and just really feel the space and the people around you and made us do like a group meditation for two minutes and then kicked it back in and because we'd all kind of had that weird moment together where we we're all giggling because it was just odd it went off so much in the second half. And I've never seen that level of, yeah, confidence and kind of charisma displayed on a stage that small. And it just felt so like powerful in that moment. So that's one of my ones. Who wants to start? Who's got a good and who they want to go in with? Should we go? I, I, I'll, I'll go. Um, I, I actually didn't know, Patrick, that you started the cavern. I, obviously, we knew that you run the, the Phoenix. And we've, we've done, um, we had a great show at the Phoenix in 2019 but uh um yeah 2019 i think it was in september 2019 yeah. that seems like forever ago <laughs> it, saying it seems forever ago but actually remembering it seems very recent but um also 2019 february 2019 we did um we did the cavern um and it and it was sold out and i'm sure you know what it's like when it's sold out and there's no way you can fit that many people in that <laughs> tiny space and it was just absolutely rocking we I think it was towards the end of, of our tour. It was our first ever headline tour. Mm. Um, and I think that was the last date on on that run, was it? Yeah, I think I so. I think so. And um, yeah, I just remember the cavern was just absolutely rocking and we've got real fond memories uh, of that show. So I'm going to go straight in and say, yeah, that show February 2019 at the cavern was just absolutely brilliant. L I loved that. Yeah, I, I am intrigued. For people who have not been to Exeter Cavern, it is a cavern underground. And so as a vertically challenged person, great time for me. I can <laughs> stage fine. As, a tall, as taller chaps, so I'm looking at Archie and Patrick and Karim. How, how, do, you, how do you go in there? Like, I'm, I'm imagining there's some hair brushing the ceilings. <laughs> It's uh, yeah, I God, no, I mean, like there's people because you've got the two, the way it's set up, you've got the two, um, you've got the bar and then you've got the venue bit, and yeah. so the, the venue bit was is totally jam packed, like you couldn't squeeze anyone else in there, and then more people squeeze in somehow. I mean, yeah. you were at the, you were there, weren't you, Sarah? I think I you, was not me. I said, oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but there's there. people like I would be if I was watching, I'd probably be on the side, like leaning in. <laughs> That's what I remember. <laughs> Something quite funny, quite funny about like going to gigs with Archie. So not when we're not on the stage is uh, people do not like him no. because he's too tall for everybody. <laughs> so it doesn't matter where we are. In fact, one one show quite funny. We were uh, coming off the stage. We'd done a support slot, and we were loading off. But it was a tiny venue in London, and so we had to load off. You know, through the crowd. Um, and he was coming back through to get, you know, the guitar amp or whatever. And this woman was like, hey, you can't push your way to the front. You're, you're too tall. And Archie was like, number one, um, I'm the band. And number two, I can't help that I'm tall. Yeah. <laughs> and it was good. They got um, into a scrap. It was good. Well, that's it was good. Not a scrap. It was <laughs> <laughs> coming out now. Well, that's, I'm going to ask about you know not true. <laughs> potentially harrowing gig moments, which I think you guys have probably had a fair few of later on. Because I just want to shed like scare the the newbies to the scene by telling them everything is going to go horribly wrong. So they hopefully don't do it. Who else has got another gig that's like a standout in their mind? Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and say to my favorite gig that I've ever performed. Unfortunately, not on UK shores, but um, Munich in Germany, which was the last like long tour we went on uh, with Hyperfora. 
and yeah easily my favorite show ever just crowd was electric the whole night the venue were really nice um we got a really nice rider we got <laughs> yeah it just it was proper felt like royalty i mean in a, in a lot of europe they seem to really take care of artists not that we don't in the uk but they kind of went the extra mile and it was really nice to be treated that way mm. um, i've got to ask now what was on your rider oh man well weirdly they had loads of vegan substitutes of like German, like deli meats and stuff, which was an absolute dream. So like a big spread, like, I don't know, meat, cheeses, spreads, crackers, all that kind of stuff. Loads of fruit as well. Um, yeah, good. good that sounds time. delicious. What was your second one quickly, Karen? Uh, my favorite gig that I'd ever put on um, was at Old Bakery in Truro, it's an all day festival called Behave. Mm. And it was just a weekend of loads of local bands and some um, not so no local bands as well. And yeah, it just felt really, it made me really proud to be part of the Cornish music scene. It was a really good vibe. Yeah, that was wicked down there. Um, Ellen, Suki and Ollie, as you guys are relatively new, I'm going to get rapid fire answers from you three. Okay, so you're ready. Okay. Best gig you've ever been to. Ellen, you start. Um, it was probably a young blood concert I went to a few years ago at Dingwalls in London um, before he was huge. So there are only about 250 people there and the stage, if you've ever been, it's like knee height. And because everyone was pushing to the front and I was right at the front, I had a lot of bruises the next day oh, no. on the stage. <laughs> but yeah, that was a crazy oh, no. gig. It was really good. Suki, what about you? Um, a couple of years ago, I saw lady called the space lady um in the fish factory in Falmouth. she's like this like quite old lady who used to busk in san francisco and for some reason she came to cornwall and i had to go on my own because no one else wanted to go with me <laughs> <laughs> and it was so good it was so nice was it one of those where because you went on your own you came back like told you all it was amazing because i've done that yeah, pretty yeah. much <laughs> good. ollie what about you I think it was Outlook Festival in 2019, and we saw Anderson Park in the Hampton Theatre. In oh, Hampton. man. Yeah. Nice. Dude, that is awesome. I'm very, very jealous. And Sushi, I'll come to you, because you have, like, a different vibe at your gigs and the gigs that you put on compared to these guys. These guys quite, you know, let's say, on the indie spectrum. You, though, were, like, fusion, Afrofusion and, like, hip-hop and just so much r and yeah. soul and stuff, which we love. What has been your favourite kind of live experience? Oh, man. Um, there's a few, but I think if I have to put it down to one, it would be uh, this... Well, I used to run events, so um, it, it, would, it would be to sort of try and promote a bit more, like, hip-hop and, like, yeah, Afrobeats and stuff like that in Plymouth because there wasn't so much of a scene to enjoy it. So it was actually like a nightclub type type thing we were doing. It's called Source and Vibes. Um, and in uh, May 2019, uh, I had an event and, and I thought, you know what, I'm making tunes, I'm dropping stuff. Let me let me grab one, you know, let me get on stage. So I had a set. It was a 40 minute set. Um, and yeah, it was just crazy because I've been putting so much work to get people to come and we had like 500 people show up. It was dope good night and i came on it was so late and and people were still up man it was it was about three a.m i still and i stepped on stage and people stayed to just check me out everybody knew all the lyrics to a song that i just dropped like three days before and i was just like wow how the hell do you guys know that we even had technical difficulties at one point and the mic cut out and it was silent and everybody was just like say, say, say. so i was like wow well, man i feel so much love on that day um, and I think it made me feel like really rewarded for putting in work um, like on the feet, talking to literally talking to people one by one and saying, yo, I'm doing this thing, giving them a fly, yo, come to my thing. And yeah, it was good. It was really good. I love it. And that is what is really impressive about you. I mean, first time, again, I got to see you live, I think it was outside of doing a session for introducing Sushi, was when we put you forward for the MTV Push event. So you were playing yeah. Ray Black and Jack James. And what I loved is that you brought down 
this massive, hugely energized crew who are all there, like obviously hyping you up and you kind of, you and your friends built so much energy in that room, which I really loved as the inverse of the classic old joke for like bands and indie artists. It was like, yeah, I really enjoyed mm -hmm. being the sound guy who didn't want to be there. So like you kind of bring it back to, to first gigs and hopefully this will be useful for, for Ellen and for Caitlin and for Ollie particularly. How do you go about putting those first gigs on? How did you do it? And like, how do you go about pulling in a crowd of you found? Because initially mm. lots of people, you know, they want to rely on their friends, but there is only so many Fridays you can steal from your mates to listen to the same songs as someone who does it a lot. Um, what would be kind of your advice? So if we start with Izzy and Archie, when you kind of started out with your gigs, what were your tactics to make sure you had a crowd and you kind of kept it fresh? I remember the first one we actually put on and, and uh, like charged tickets for because for a while we we used Spiritual Bar, which is a, a venue in London where you can just go and it's free and they have music on every night. Um, and it's that, that's kind of like where we found our feet. But then we decided to kind of, you know, actually do something. We, we wanted to sell tickets. We wanted to kind of make that step. We were our own promoter for yeah. a, a little while. We didn't have a manager. We didn't have an agent. We It was literally the two of us. And we we booked out the Half Moon in Putney, which is like 100 and I think it's like 150. And and it was like, you know, old school friends, people that you haven't spoken to. You, you know, you just want the room to be full. Um, but we just tried our absolute hardest to basically. Uh, yep, held uh, a gun to their head. <laughs> <laughs> Not recommended. I hasten to add. <laughs> Like especially what you were saying about you know handing out flyers like like individual people everyone counts mm -hmm. especially in those early days so like you know anyone that you can think of who you think might want to come down you ask them you send them a Facebook message you know you reach out and that was really how we did it literally person by person um, wow. for, for that first show and it was amazing it was it was we sold it out uh, we, we we were so nervous we made a huge huge thing of it and it and it paid off and then. That was in the summer. And then the next one we did again, no manager, no agent. We did the Battersea Art Center, which was a 300 cap. And our kind of, um, our theory a lot of the time is like, do a really, really great show and then hope that everyone comes again and brings a friend. <laughs> it's kind that's of our, yeah, that's it. There's our no theory. point. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna bully everyone to coming down the first time, you can't bully them again. You've got to make sure that you do that absolute best show you've ever done in your your entire life so that they they, they want to come again um and obviously you can't always control that um but that was that was certainly our theory when we did the half moon was right come on we really need to make sure that these people that have probably come down and gone oh yeah all right let's go and see what's going on they need to desperately want to see us again um and you know that was that was our theory. I'm sure half of them, you know, just never ever come back. But this is the You need them to want to come back and bring a friend. Yeah, so yeah. Totally right. Yeah. I like that, like a pyramid scheme of gig goers. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> they bring their mates. So that's it. That's why live music is so important. Why we're missing it so much because you really can grow a career through live music just yeah. through the basic principle is he said when you get on support tours for the first time the old, the whole idea is to is to cut your teeth and and get some experience and 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 improve but you are trying to steal the person's fans that you're supporting that's yeah. that's what you're trying to do so you have to go out and do the best possible gig you've you've done every single night um and hope that when you put your own tour on that that that, that you know, some of those people in that audience are going to buy tickets to your show. Mm. Um, you know, that's that's kind of what we we were doing. Yeah, you guys are excellent thieves, is what has been made apparent <laughs> over the last couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> Karen, I saw you nodding sagely to that. As a promoter, as a artist touring in a band, and now as a solo artist, is all of that kind of tallying with you? Absolutely, um, especially you know, people call it guerrilla marketing, but like literally going out like waiting at for the sort of exit of gigs that are going on in the area standing with flyers giving it out to people wherever the venue is going in there like weeks in advance making sure they've got posters up for the event um for me uh, i started putting gigs on like properly promoting in like late secondary school and like first year of college which is great because you've got like a central hub where you know 
your audience is already there you just need to convince them to go yeah. so you know just a case of postering flyering and giving people a reason not to do anything else is yeah. a big one like if you can give people the incentive to come to your show that that's a that's a first stepping stone but then making sure that you're like moving forward you're the first option for like a good night out or you know a good time is the next thing yeah patrick as the person who kind of has to take on the risk of putting on artists for like booking out your venue for that person that night giving them the trust is this filling you with happiness that these guys are hustling so much to get people in yeah i think we're all missing the social aspect aren't we of music i mean you can listen to music you can watch it on a screen but it's meeting up with friends it's that real visceral experience shared experience of being in the same room with some fantastic music. You can't replicate that on mm -hmm. the screen. And and it's it's all part of how we live, isn't it? It's how we spend our our, our leisure time. It's it's so key and, and you know, we're, yeah, we're all massively waiting for that. Not just me as a, a, a venue manager, but you know, we all need it, don't we? we, we you know, there's only so much we can do uh, at home in front of a laptop, isn't it? So. Totally true. And I suppose, big question for you Patrick obviously at this point we're discussing someone's already got the gig but let's say for these guys in particular they want to play at Phoenix because they're smart people and Phoenix is a great venue how would they go about making those initial kind of first contacts with you to put out the feelers for a gig well they can email me I mean uh, you know I'm very approachable uh, on the website got my contact details so get in touch that's the best way it's always the best way nothing mm. to lose just you know send an email yeah that's what i always say to people it's like so many people are like how did you get your job i'm like i sent an email and then they didn't answer <laughs> so I sent another one where i went so sorry i don't think you got my first email and if you just polite make a few bad jokes in my case then it, it, it tends to work out all right and i'm presuming that's kind of how we all got there Ollie, to come to you, we were chatting the other day and you were saying that you kind of started out as an acoustic artist, you know, busking and performing like in pubs and stuff. Then though, you moved up to London, now back in Devon, and you started with the kind of production side and left the live alone. What was it that stopped you kind of performing live at that point? It's a good question. I think um, mainly because what I was doing musically was so much more complicated. It was actually quite hard to work out how to play it live um, and, and actually persuading people to join me on stage kind of you know you can't tell someone to do this that and everything else for you for free so it got quite expensive um mm. so, i mean i guess i didn't leave doing live by choice i think it's just more that it, it kind of got more difficult to do it and you know i've done a few really cool things and found some great nights and some great venues and you know formed in like the ministry for example just just singing for someone um and it's just kind of building things up regularly is so tough and that's why mm. I guess looking at people like Ferris and Sylvester, just seeing how often they play, I think for me, that's the most impressive thing is just keeping it up just all the time. It's just yeah. I mean, please do correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but Suki, I know that your rig is obviously quite tech oriented, isn't it? But then you're also kind of doing loops. So it's quite tricky for you to kind of pull it all together live, right? Yeah, I mean, a similar kind of thing I used to, do it with like a band and, and that kind of thing. And then I started writing the stuff for this project and I was like, I actually hate playing guitar live, it's so stressful. <laughs> um, so I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna push some buttons, do that kind of thing, press on some pedals. If I press something wrong, it probably will sound fine. Maybe I can get away with it. It's just less stressful, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, and then Sushi, when I've seen you play live, you've had DJ and like guys with you on the vocals, which again is like a, a big setup. And Threelin, have you performed live kind of at all under this moniker yet? How's that been working out for you? Um, I haven't actually performed live as Threelin um, ever because it's kind of quite recent and I've only been putting music out for about a year, so I've never yeah. really thought about performing mm. live yet but definitely would like to when we can 
Okay, well, this is great for my next question. Thank you all for being so convenient in your lives. Um, so you've all kind of got these elaborate rigs, which are quite tricky for you to facilitate in live settings, be that monetarily, be that space-wise, be that, and in Suki's case, as you said, literally just in terms of not having eight hands. If I were to go to Izzy and Archie right now, because you guys, I've seen you play with a full band going full, kit and caboodle held to leather but also you can strip it back to yeah. just the two of you to the core two what was that process like for you and did you learn anything that could maybe help these guys facilitate their gigs in the future uh, certainly I'll, I'll start Sean Sorry. yeah do yeah. it um yeah, uh, no it's a, it's a really good question and and I think um the answer is for us it took us we were frustrated for a while same problems you know we wanted to portray something that we couldn't afford to portray live um and then we sort of realized that um you have to embrace your limitations um especially live in the studio nowadays if you've got a laptop and you've got an interface you don't have any limitations you can make any sound you want and that's not necessarily a good thing because you can end up never deciding you know um you're gonna go oh no do i want that synthesizer or no 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 no. it should be a bit like that and you constantly constantly changing it and and actually that it shouldn't always be like that and when i go and see a show i don't want to go and see um something that i could have just listened to on spotify i want to see the live version i don't, I don't really care if i mean I, I want to see the artist interpret it live and mm. i understand that they're going to have those limitations so i don't care if there's a string part that's missing if they're putting on the performance and it, it um so yeah i'll just say embrace your limitations and for, for us what that meant was um izzy went from playing acoustic guitar to playing bass um when we were when we started playing live um and then eventually um i started playing a kick drum behind me um we could have gone down the route of of tracks and stuff but we decided for what we wanted to do that wasn't going to be right for us Mm. Um, so everything that you hear at a Ferris and Sylvester show is happening there and then. So it means that we can't possibly put on, even when we have been able to afford uh, to take a band with us, we still, you know, it's not everything from a recording that we're putting across. We, you're still, it is still slightly stripped back because it, it just has to be. Um, but yeah, and, and just practice like more than you you know you could ever imagine that you wanted to like get it right if you're going to go out on stage in front of people you, you know and you want them to come back and see it you've got to be confident in the fact that you're going to be good that you're going to press press the right button at the right time and you're going to play the right chord or um or whatever but um yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of how we did it. Is that fair to say, Izzy? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think, yeah, as Archie said, embrace your limitations because we all have them. No one's rich enough or has enough time or has enough, you know, sockets on, on a stage. You know, there's, there's always going to be something yeah. that, that means that you can't do exactly how, how you want, but that's okay. And as Archie said, at the end of the day, it's all about the song. You've got to just do what gets the song across um, and you know uh, about playing guitar on stage i totally understand what you, what what you're talking about like i wasn't i'm i'm a i'm a writer i'm a singer i never liked playing guitar on stage archie's a fantastic guitar player and uh, I, I picked up the bass and and i've i've rolled with it ever since i absolutely love playing it it gives me power like I, good confidence that i never really knew i could have but we only figured that out from from trying out a bunch of stuff and experimenting and coming up with uh, arch has got like a real production head as well so sometimes some of our ideas have been really really crazy and uh most of them work so you know but you can only get there from 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 giving it giving it a crack 100 percent. well i reckon now would be a good time to go to questions because i know that loads of you have them for both patrick and izzy and archie so shall we start with james you got any questions hmm, hmm. i feel like a few a couple of mine have been answered um yeah. but yeah my i think my main what what i've kind of struggled with is like if if what you do is not the most sort of popular Thing or there's not a scene going on for that how um how have you found it to generate interest in something that's basically new for people if there's not so much comparison that, that you can you can put forward you know what i mean 
Patrick, are you yeah. happy to take that one on first? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but potentially tricky. I, I think you just have to look around for the right opportunity, the right showcase, the right venue. Um, but you can start small, I, I would say. Start small, if you, especially if you, you know, you're doing something new, something, something about, perhaps a bit, bit different, not not perhaps, you know, necessarily the flavour of the month. I mean, it could become the flavour of the month. But start small, start in a space where you've got some friends that can give you some feedback, um, you know, positive uh, and possibly negative feedback, but, but feedback that you trust from people that you trust. Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, to start small before you start ramping it up or scaling it up. Start small, really, uh, and build your confidence that way as well. You know, don't, don't jump in the deep end, um, uh, you know, uh, at, at a really big venue. Um, you know, hone your, your craft, if you like, on a smaller stage. Mm. That is a, a really good point because it's interesting looking at who we've got in here. I mean, Ferris and Sylvester, kind of Americana, blues, amazing rock going on. Then we've got Sushi doing, as I say, Afrofusion, hip hop, beautiful kind of soul. Suki with your like really trilling, beautiful synth led indie. Ollie, kind of R&B and soul again. Then we've got Web Moms, Karam, as you kind of doing your... I'm going to call it atmospheric indie. That's what I'm going to go with. Then Hyperfora going far more kind of down your alt strand and Threelin with the like brand new kind of really well produced, beautiful kind of alt pop. All of which aren't things that I see an awful lot on stages in kind of smaller venues. Largely, it is you know you're looking at your your indie bands, the people who are you know shredding on stage, who have already got layers of you know cider stuck to their shoes. They're they're the people who are often there. So looking at kind of Karen and Patrick again, Karen with your promoter head on, what would you say is a good piece of advice for someone from, as Sushi put it, maybe one of those kind of more outside genres to the normal kind of live music scene to get those gigs on because it is basically a case of persuasion right literally um one thing that really sort of helped us um in reference to high before because we sort of straddled this weird progressive like not mainstream rock but not metal but somewhere in between um it was sort of piggybacking on other local acts and almost creating the interest in this kind of genre that not a lot of people in that crowd may have necessarily heard before. Um, you know, you can't just sort of magic up fans of a genre in an area where that genre is not prevalent. Mm. So it's almost a case of, you know, support again, support slots, because there may be people in that crowd that are going to hear music and go, oh, wow, I really connect with that. I didn't realize that I would because I've never, you know, had needed to. But now that I have heard it, okay, yeah, it's more, it's something that I'm interested in. And it's like consistently doing that alongside, you know, performing your own events and stuff. And a, a lot of it's really kind of like a time thing, mm. um, you know, building a fan base over time. But from my personal experience, combining you know your friends and the people in the circles around you with people that may not necessarily like come to your show or you know listen to your music and almost like forcing it in their face you know playing with artists that are slightly different but similar enough that their audience would appreciate your stuff yeah it's that connectivity and, and Izzy and Archie, what you were saying about stealing the fans from the artists you're supporting. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I, I would also say that if you can't find anything that you can fit into, whether that's a night or a venue or a promoter or whatever, do it yourself. Start up with, uh, your own night. Uh, mm -hmm. You can hire you know, rooms at the back of pubs. You can find spaces, village halls. Put on your own gigs. You know, do it yourself. Build, a, build your own scene, you know, that, yeah. that way you get all sorts of experience. It can be, uh, you know, it can be tough, it can be, can be a lot of hard knocks, but, you know, do it yourself, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. Nice to be agreed, Patrick. Yeah, any more burning questions, guys? Suki, Ellen? Um, um, this is for anyone who has toured before. Um, what's your favourite thing about touring? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I, 
it's so funny because you can really look at it in like kind of rose tinted glasses because it's been you know a year i'd i'd probably say that it's obviously kind of a side it's always going to be about the performing and the buzz that you get from being on stage that you know that is really unbeatable and it really does in, in our experience that does not necessarily correlate with the size of the gig that you're playing you know some of our best shows have been to 100 people you know rather than some of our most nerve-wracking shows that have been to the thousands that actually haven't quite felt um as we thought they would um but then i think as seconds to the performance side that there, there's something really uh exhilarating about about um being on the road and sharing experiences with with other musicians like um i don't know there's a lot of like funny memories that we have like especially when times get a bit a bit rough because it is quite hard touring can be really hard especially when you're on a budget and it's cold and you're in somewhere in germany in february and uh archie has put all the rider in our bag and it's you know exploded so we have to go to the laundry <laughs> mat which we can't afford and to wash all, all of our clothes which means that we can't get any food you know it can be kind of like that but then if you're yeah. if, you're, if you're with the right very people, specific yeah, yeah. And <laughs> if you're with the right people um you know the all of these kind of day-to-day -day stuff actually turn into like really great memories um and so i think that even even in the early days like you know we're still very much touring around small venues and stuff especially in europe before everything uh happened last year we were literally touring in europe right up to the to the cutoff um and they weren't particularly big venues but but it's just yeah the experience enjoy the experience i think and don't get bogged down too much in like numbers and 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 sales i think that that's also quite an important thing you can get kind of bogged down in in what's about to happen and who's going to be there and it is the is the room going to be full and all of that and i just think that in hindsight um don't look at that stuff just enjoy it in the moment yeah, Izzy, I love the, let's just say that your rider were to explode nature of that <laughs> scathing comment to Archie. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't want your underwear smelling of Carlsberg. To be yeah, honest. oh my <laughs> God, it was <laughs> delicious. Um, any more questions from you guys? Ollie, have you got anything you'd like to ask? Um, I think my questions get quite technical and, and might be more for an email. <laughs> 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 I quite like that. Well, that is probably quite a good thing to say is that all of you guys are obviously lovely. And for anyone watching this who has kind of maybe further questions, are you, let's say, happy to take questions? And would you say that that is just a good tactic to take with finding more out about the industry? Because a lot of the time people are quite scared to ask, I think. Definitely. Uh, yeah. If anyone, you know, wants some advice from us, I mean, it's, we're still, I, it feels like we're learning something every day you know especially even now maybe, you know maybe we've been touring apart from the last year we've done i don't know two two or three years of of uh, touring kind of non-stop but um we're still learning stuff we still feel like absolute babies and like we've got so much to, to learn still uh but i guess you know there's one or two things we picked up along the way that we may have done slightly differently yeah. Um, but yeah if you have any technical questions ollie uh i don't know send us a message on instagram or something and going back to that point about patrick had the point just sending an email and you said it as well sarah it it's so important and always follow it up and we guess people's emails e people's emails are actually really really easy to guess like oh, yeah. sarah yeah. gosling at bbc <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not tricky. Name dot name at company dot co dot uk usually works a dream. Always works. Yeah. <laughs> always we've, done, works. we've done that so so many times. Um, still doing it like yeah. most days on that grind. <laughs> Patrick, just before we kind of end. Obviously, this is an independent venue week chat, as is so subtly put at the bottom and on my t-shirt. <laughs> Obviously, Phoenix is still closed at the moment. Hopefully, we'll be opening very soon. But right now, and once they open, what are the best ways that we can support our venues? Come along. Come. Come along. <laughs> you need to come in. Nice. <laughs> come and say it. hello. It's, it's, it's a social thing, as I said before. It's coming and saying hello. It's engaging. You know, it's having a good time. It's having a night out. You know, come. And we can throw some good music in, you know, as well. So, 
yeah, come out. You know, when we're all out to do come out, do do yeah. come and see us. You know. 100%. I expect to see you all down at Exeter Phoenix having a jam. We'll just put on a night with all of you guys. That would yeah, be a yeah, genre yeah. absolute feast. I'd love that. <laughs> guys, thank you all so much. Can I get a quick load of nods? Who is planning on performing live this year? If they can. Um, oh, 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 we're, we're looking at a solid. I'm going to go at 85% and a lot of uncertainty from Ollie with his pot plant. But I'll work <laughs> that. Guys, thank you so, so much for doing this independent venue week chat. Sushi Sound, Ferris and Sylvester, Suki, Karen Cooper, Patrick Cunningham from Exeter Phoenix, Ollie Hannaford, and Three Lynn. You're all amazing. Thank you so much for joining. And remember, you can catch BBC Music introducing in the Southwest every Saturday night from 8 pm on Radio Devon, Cornwall, Somerset, and on BBC Sounds. Thank you. Ooh.